Good morning and welcome for the third and last day of Fresh Web Radio Live. We are in Paris, it is um, 10 past 10 local time, Friday, 22nd of September, and you are listening to the live stream of Fresh, Fresh, the international event for the development of contemporary circus and outdoor arts. Outdoor, yes, we are almost outdoor. Uh, today, under the rainy sky of Paris, we are at La Pelouse Rue, which is uh, located in the eastern part of, of Paris, still in Paris, but close to the Bois uh, de Vincennes. Bois de Vincennes, where you might know there is a new uh, zoo that was uh, renovated a few years ago, very uh, a beautiful place. But here we are also under a very beautiful top, a top blue circus, a big top, the top of the village de Cirque where there is a festival, a circus festival actually these days until uh, Sunday. My name is uh, Aude Lavigne, I'm a French uh, journalist and be your guide on this exclusive web radio station streaming live in this third morning session of Fresh for you to be able to listen to it all around the world and to make it possible with me, Clément from uh, Making Wave uh, Association and uh, to stream it all around the world uh, it's, uh, we have the help of all around. Today on live you will be able to, to follow to the discussion, morning talks, artistic talk, round table, and additional small interview we realize with the partners of, of Fresh. They are coming to join us. We are in a small angle. We found a place to be with you and to make you able to listen to what is going on today. You can hear the crowd coming in this uh, kind of noisy place. Each place, as you can hear, has its specific sound. We were first in, uh, in La Villette, in the theater. Yesterday we were to a wooden uh, top place. And today we are in a kind of uh, uh, very light uh, tissue, kind of plastic. Uh, a classical circus place, which is maybe, um, let's say, 30 meters diameter. Today, while the people are entering into the place, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the schedule and the, the program we will listen to very soon. The topic, as you know, it's always different every day. The first day it was safe. Yesterday it... No, sorry. <laughs> Making a mistake. First day it was about care, to care. Yesterday it was about uh, uh, safe. And uh, today a very interesting topic, sustainability. And uh, it will start so with a keynote. Keynote uh, made by Eric Lenoir with... Uh, uh, landscape designer. He will talk about sustainability and he will join us at the radio place to talk a little bit more about it. Then um, after this first uh, intervention you will have uh, an artistic uh, talk led by two artists that uh, will we don't really know what they will say, but we are very surprised. It is uh, Maria Baranos, Kate Lieberman, and Andrea Salustri. After this, this, this artistic talk, uh, I'll be happy to, to have on the radio um, an artist that will talk about a new place, a new circus place here in Paris. It's called Rue Watt, and we will listen to 
the way he, he, he did already different performance in this new urban place in Paris. And then it will uh, finish with a big um, round table involving five panelists, always, always about this topic of uh, sustainability. And we might uh, leave each other after all this. It will be around uh, one o'clock. And um, as you know, you can follow us on circostrada.org. Circostrada, the, the, the network of contemporary circus and outdoor art. It's more than 300 members, more than 40 countries here in Paris. We are almost 300 people talking, uh, gathering, going to see performances in the afternoon, discovering places in Paris and around in Paris. You know, you will be able also to follow to this uh, a recording through podcast that will be made after the event and also the publication. But I, I can see people going towards the stage, the main stage, here in Pelouse, Reuilly, village de Cirque. Uh, let's listen a little bit uh, to the crowd, maybe meeting people while we are waiting for the start to begin. Hello? Hello. Where, where are you from? Uh, Brooklyn, New York. Come, can you come with me? We're going to talk with... Coming from Brooklyn? Yes. United States? Yes. <laughs> uh, wh what are you doing? Uh, I'm here on behalf of the nonprofit Thomas Dot, so I'll be taking part in a session at 3 p.m. today, so discussing work visas uh, for artists who'd like to come and perform in the U.S. And it's quite difficult to get in the U.S.? It is very difficult. So I'm going to be uh, debunking some sort of pervasive myths and just sort of talking about like the bureaucratic procedure of it all and the costs associated as well. Okay, and what is your advice? My advice? Yeah, to get the visa uh, to get the to the of States. My head, start is sorry, early. Sorry. Can you start again? Starting the process as early as possible would be like my number one tip because it can be quite long, months even. So, uh, what's your name again? Uh, my name is Shelley Pinker, and I'm with Thomas Dot. And and your uh, organization is called Thomas Dot. <laughs> okay, it's a big one. Uh, it's pretty small actually. There's only, I think we have about three employees right now, so it's quite small, but. And uh, who is uh, helping you to get uh, money to, to be able to have your foundation? How do you work? We have a national endowment for the arts grant that we work with. So, uh, And we take donations as well from those who are interested. Uh, I guess it's starting. Thank you to you from Brooklyn. Welcome to Village de Cirque. Bienvenue au Village de Cirque. My English is really, uh, it's a sleepy English, so uh, I'll be fast. Oula, j'ai un très bon anglais, surtout le matin quand elle se réveille. Et du coup, je vous présente, et j'ai le plaisir de vous présenter Marie Chapouillet, qui est la co-directrice de la coopérative de rue de Cirque. Ok, so my name is Marie Chapouillet, and I have the pleasure to work at the direction of coopérative de rue de Cirque with Rémi Bovis, with who is the founder? Founder? The founder, thank you. Uh, really, we are really pleased to see you here, ladies, gentlemen, and others uh, at Village de Cirque. Village de Cirque is a festival who, who supports uh, circus creation under Big Top, of course, and outdoor circus. It's uh, one of, uh, it's a part of activity of Cooperative de Rue de Cirque. Uh, today it's a little uh, rainy, we are really sorry, but uh, we hope that the rain is, is going away soon and uh, we hope that you will have a really 
interesting and pleasant time here under our big top and this afternoon uh, at Ruat, at the Montfort and at Le Poinçon. Thank you so much to you. And now you can say it in French, perhaps, Rémi. Je pense que tout le monde a compris. On va passer une super journée. Que la pluie so we're going to have a great été, day. The rain will stop. Matin, and and this morning we're here. And this afternoon we'll be in three different spots. What outside and inside? New what is the place for creation that we opened exactly one year ago? I'd like to add one thing which is important to us in the uh, Rue de Sierre. We've been a member of Circus Strata for years now, and we try to develop support for artists across all disciplines in public spaces uh, and also in the big top to defend minorities, to defend shows that are produced in difficult conditions, that give voice to people that we don't hear from anymore. And we do include a very diversified programming for all kinds of audiences, for everyone. And our programming is really based on that. It's important for us to be here and that there's so many of you here today and yesterday 40 countries represented, over 300 people participating. I think that today, when when expression is threatened, artistic expression and the freedom of expression is suffering in many of your countries, in many regions of France as well. There are collectivities, uh, government, uh, local government um, that is taking steps they would never have dared take before. And I think it's important for us to come together in all the langu languages we can to defend minorities and this freedom of expression that's so important to all of us. I wish you a wonderful morning and, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you later. You Work so well. Circus Prada, who organized, who organized those three days, incredible three days, and Arsena, uh, thank you so much for, to them. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if somebody was sleeping, <laughs> it's the end. Uh, thank you so much, Maria and Remy, for this introduction. Um, I'm just going to take a few moments to say that I'm very happy to see how many of you still stayed on Friday. It's, I know it's tiring and it's rainy, but the rain will stop. Okay. Um, also, what I wanted to say is that I was uh, super, I feel super lucky and privileged to have been part of so many conversations during these two days on care, on safety, and today on sustainability. But there is really one conversation that really was fascinating last night that I want to share with you is the one on chickpeas. And if chickpeas should be cooked or not. And it's really uh, a good conversation because when you talk about care and safety, and really, chickpeas become the priority of your professional life. So I was really happy for you to have this conversation last night. I hope this is one of the best takeaways from this fresh event. And, uh, you know, really, thank you so much for this. Um, where do our priorities are, right? Anyways, um, this comes from a place of love, of course. Ching! Um, so today we are super lucky to have with us Eric Lenoir. Eric Lenoir is a landscape designer. He's here with us. He's going to give us a keynote around 20 minutes in French. So if you don't have your headset, go get it there now or in the next couple of minutes. I can see. Right, and uh, the, the, all the other interventions will be in English, okay? So, but only this one will be in French. So, I'm going to read the title of <laughs> the keynote, so it gives you some time to go get your set. And the title of the keynote is "Caring for the Living and Earning a Decent Living," or "How to Respect Your Ecological Commitment Without Giving Up Your Job." So it's quite an interesting title. Um, without any further ado, 
I will give the floor to Monsieur Lenoir. <laughs> and we'll welcome you on stage. Merci. Bonjour à tous. J'attends un petit peu que chacun Hello puisse everyone. I'll just give a moment for everyone to get their headset. Je peux broder, uh, dire Should I just, uh, just start by saying I'm so happy to be here? And I'd like to thank Art Sena to, for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about this topic. I'm going to speak slowly to begin while people get their headsets and get set up. The recipe for the uh, chickpeas, Stefan, did, did you get it? It's a real, uh, it's a very important issue. We could talk about uh, uh, greenhouse gases in relationship to the chickpeas. So, how can we respect our ecological commitment without, without uh, giving up your job? As a landscape uh, um, designer, landscape designer, and as a citizen, even still, it's more important, even just as a citizen, I am doing a job that is related to living things, and I have to sell something to people, I have to change a territory and, and land, and in our context, it can be a little complex. We have a problem sometimes that we all want to go towards sustainability, the environment, ecology, saying, all right, I get it, I'm going to do what needs to be done. The only problem is the immense majority of people doesn't really know what the stakes are and what they represent. So we can't be wrong. This, this is the famous, uh, this is not a pipe. We can say this is not a forest. That's a plantation of trees. That's not a forest. I have a little technical trouble here. Oops, oh. daisy. These are forests. Can you see the difference? This is not a forest. It's it's a um, it is a grove. I love low, I'm just going to embrace low tech here. As I said, we make a new green space for leisure, and then people give you this. It's just right next door. This is 10 kilometers from here. Someone says, this is a mistake. This is disinformation. This is misinformation. The intention may have been good, but when it lends to this kind of result, with, with fences everywhere and a forest that was destroyed, to make this instead, this is not uh, helping the climate. This is not ecological. And it's not the, the approach we want to take today. This is misinformation, this misleading information. So despite ourselves, we are feeding a dangerous system while thinking that we're doing a good thing. We need a little bit. We need demand. We need to be demanding, but also humble. The number of people who do just just terrible things, trying to do things right, is, is really quite high, and we're all probably guilty of that, without realizing it. For example, very interesting. You can eat avocados because you want to try not to eat uh, meat. But they come from Chile or Mexico, they're organic, but still, we make uh, benches out of recycled plastic. So we have favored the use, continued use of plastic, and we put more into the environment. You've got uh, um, logs from railway lines to recycle them and make tables. And there's creosote inside them, which is uh, very highly polluting, and we all think we're doing great. Here we can. Uh, so this is like a magic show. It works. It doesn't work. It's all an illusion. Bees is a major issue. We all want to save the bees. Everywhere in the planet. We said we need to save the bees because I instead said on Facebook that if bees disappeared, that if there were no bees, there would be no humans. He never said that just between you and I, it doesn't matter, it's inspiring. And it's very, very important to save the bees, except that these are domestic bees, they don't matter. We don't need to save sheep to save wild nature. 
We don't need to save domestic bees to save nature. I'll do this and maybe it'll work. In Paris, there are 1,000 to 2,000 beehives. That's 15 hives per square kilometer. That's a huge amount of beehives. Now we're trying to forbid people from putting on uh, hives up. And now the city is starting to have to forbid it because there are too many. They're the domestic animals, they're pets. They have a, punct a function. Okay, they need to produce honey. Uh, by uh, pollinizing flowers, and it gives us uh, fruits and seeds. The only problem is they are big and fat. They, are, they don't pollinize all the flower, and they put a pheromone on those flowers, which says, I've eaten it all. So if you look here, there's a couple of millimeters long. They live in the ground alone. They're disappearing because we've put so many hives. They're the ones we need. Butterflies that are pollinizing, they also drink in uh, dirty water, not only pollinizing flowers, and they will also uh, disappear if there are too many bees. When we do, do uh, landscaping here, we put these um, plants with lots of flowers to bring domestic bees to an area, but that kills the bees that are in the ground. We just need to leave the, the wild areas as they are. This is worse than ever, worse than ever. Oh, gosh. I've made, oh, here we go, made another magic trick. So a whole different font. What's going on? This is incredible. Circus is incredible. You just never know what's going to happen in a circus tent. So honestly question your practices. What do I, am I doing and why? And what are, is what I'm doing really useful? Or is it maybe counterproductive? Is it dangerous, in fact? If you make a big show like Burning Man, a big festival, which is supposed to be ecological and environmental, leave no trace, being... The theme, that's great, but maybe uh, it's great to leave in a trace, but what a mess on the way. 70,000 people in a, in a in the middle of a desert, it means there's water. When you burn things like that, 3,000 liters of kerosene per hour in, on fire, uh, air conditioning in all the camping cars, in the mobile homes that work with the petrol-fueled uh, electricity generators, and then the beginning, it started off being um, environmental. Now people come in their private jets, several. There are the stars that come in their private jets, which have a little bit of an environmental impact, nonetheless. It's not exactly as it was supposed to be. Oh, no! This is, so you have the fire, but when it burns, that's a disgusting black fur, uh, smoke that comes out. That's the road traffic to, that is it there to go to Burning Man. And this year, with the rain, it looked like that. That's what we can see. That's the tip of the iceberg. That's the part you can't not see. It's a big problem. Look at it. But what you don't see so much is this. All the animals that were uh, moved out for days, weeks, or years because of the stress by that kind of event is colossal for animals. We don't know what's happening, really. People come to Burning Man have no idea about life in the desert. And one of the species is this shrimp that lives in the middle of the desert. They live in as eggs. When it rains, they can come to life. But while there are 70,000 people stomping around in that area where they were supposed to, they would have been born. This is uh, fields, from, uh, birds from fields. This is the effect from a, of a fire, um, the uh, New Year's Eve fireworks display. All of the populations of birds were totally stressed in the middle of the night, at, uh, at January 1st at midnight, that's in Belgium. 
they just fly away, they're so stressed, they're animals that die, they hit each other in panic. There are nests that disappear, all kinds of things. And also on the 14th of July, we say, can we recycle aluminium of uh, coffee capsules? So let's talk about the idea of resilience. Almost. This is a context. You can talk about the environment, little gestures that we make, how we, the actions we take. The context is this. What I'm doing is what I'm doing, big, like on the right scale for the stakes here. When you see uh, forest dying, deserts appearing in France, that's a fire. Charleroi in Belgium near uh, some uh, factory, when you see the Anthropocenic era, which we could also call the capitalistic era, which is now in the geological layers and shows the results of our activity. It's pretty ugly. It's nice to uh, sort. It's great. Oh, also great to uh, uh, sort your trash, but maybe we need to go further. Then you've got Dubai. Fantastic. But lucky, here we are. If you're here, is that you want to change things, at least you want to change your practices. You've already considered that there is a problem, even if you haven't explored all of the levels of that problem. You have to, have to start by admitting your vulnerability and our interdependence. What is our level of interdependence with our, the, the environment we live in. It's, un, it's an unbelievably high. Does anyone know the word hollow beyond? You can live, raise your hand if you know it already. The example, a perfect example of hollow beyond is coral. You have little polyps, there's little organisms. They're in a huge colony on a mineral structure that they have create, created themselves. Another hollow beyond is you. You and your micro microbiont, all the microbes you have in your body and yourself, that's a hollow biont. You're a living being made up of other living beings. You have to consider that we are a bigger part of a bigger hollow biont, which is the planet, which is very complex and fragile. We can move forward. Yeah. All the little elements, all the tiny, 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 tiny elements that are part of living life on Earth interact with the others at all levels, whether it's you burn a big fire in the middle of the desert with 3,000 liters of kerosene, or you're just walking in the street. There's always an interaction. Let's come back to this. Animals, remembering that, that being there, there's always a, an interaction with the rest of the environment Donc, around you. So if you want to be able to move forward in our sector, we have to consider our role in the hollow biont. What is our place? Am I an element, a major element where I am? Am I destructive? Can I, am I positive? We're all of those things at once, in fact, with variables that can change a lot from one context to another or from a, one moment to another. So we need to be humble because we depend on nature. We know now with 100% certainty that biodiversity, the diversity of all of the living beings, is very important to limit risks of pandemics, you have less, uh, fewer pandemics and epidemics when you have high levels of biodiversity. We all know that it's collapsing and we may have play a role in that. So we need to cause less damage as well as protect it. So we may need to also look at biodiversity to save it just to, to, in order to live. See, there's, there's some water today. Sure, there's still water tomorrow. Will there still be water left? In case of doubts, always favor our simplicity and, and, and treading lightning. If I don't know what to do, if I have a doubt, if I think that maybe I might cause damage, 
I'll try to keep find this the easiest, lightest solution that would need the less the slowest amount of technology of infrastructure, the, the least amount of everything. It's not always painful. In my job as a landscape designer, it's a kind of way of life. I accept poverty from sometimes. Now it doesn't make me suffer anymore because I have a little bit of notor notoriety and I, I give my talks, but I've better said to some clients who asked me certain things, I had to refuse. I said, I won't do it because I think it is damaging. I don't think it makes sense. I think your ethics is rotten and you're bastards and I don't want to work for you. It also goes through inventiveness, which is a bit uh, ballsy. You have to change your imagination. In, in large landscape uh, design, we're supposed to be uh, Instagrammable, the things we design. They're supposed to be very pretty. When I get to people and I give them that, I say, it's finished. You can come home. That's done. I've done it now. Uh, you have to you have to really work hard with them. You've got to massage that, that idea. In the following months, it changed and it looked at. It had to start off looking like that, and then I'm, I've created a place. You don't need to water. You never need to take care of the trees. It will be biodiverse. There'll be no problem with water. It will come there. It will inf infiltrate the soil, and instead of running away, you'll have flowers that weren't planned for, but it will cost you nothing. But it has to start by looking like this. If I had done that, leaving, if I had left the, the school doing that, I would never have passed the exams. This is also in agriculture, where we're starting to design things differently. We're coming back to ancient practices. We're kind of reinventing uh, the wheel. And so we're kind of coming backwards to do after we went to 120 million inhabitants, and now we've got 8 billion. So feeding people, it's a different scale now. And there's some good experiments that have been done. So instead of having big uniform fields, we're having things now that are much more diversified. Instead of having crops that are enormous, we're divided into small parcels, and it works. It doesn't work in, with simplicity. There's also a question of clientele for that. If you want to plant trees in the middle of the field, you have to eat something what's on the tree. And because peasants are not going to plant stuff that people, no one can eat, they can't sell. These key lines are different kinds of crop. Instead of doing, we do lines, and then we put trees and we mix the crops. Instead of having a huge, uh, very expensive wheat crop, particularly since we can't get it from uh, Ukraine. You have a bit less wheat, so a bit less money, but you'll have much more resilience as a result. Instead of saying, I want this, I want that, at the place that I, I have, we have to say, what could I do in this place? And what place can I leave for the rest of, the, of life? It gives that. It's nothing, but costs nothing. Between making a just a lawn and to do that, the 20 species that can appear because the person decided to just use the uh, lawn mower to make a heart instead of taking everything off. You could be creative. It's an anarchist, anarchist landscape designer. I can see my job this way, a little bit of humility. I try to do as good a job as she does, because this is what she does. She can make that, that landscape. It didn't cost very much, huh? There's four posts, one cow in the middle, and that's what the landscape ends up looking like, because a lot of landscape... There's not a lot of landscape artists that could make something so beautiful as that cow. Uh, pulling our efforts, very important. I'm not going to... You don't need to hear that as circus performance. Of course, you know that working together is key. The living world is inspired by that. Here you have an insect, which... It eats uh, rotting flesh. Charming. But these are parasites on him. These are um, mites that know that this 
species will take it some, somewhere where they can find food. So the insect is okay to carry them. The uh, the mites might even solve some of his problems, and they just he just takes them where they want to go. The, the bigger insect doesn't die more because of that, and it doesn't cost anything more physically. It's not a big effort for him or her. It doesn't try to get rid of the uh, mites on its back. It doesn't bother. And maybe sometimes that the bigger the bigger ones can carry the smaller ones in the world. Pulling our efforts here to transform things. We have an imagination. Maybe we could do it collectively. And maybe working together, we can we can make it look like something. Here you see initiatives by citizens who want to take, uh, they're saying, who will take care of poorer people if it's not us? Is it the workers' fraternity? Where two crazy guys that, that grains, seeds that allowed you to grow food for yourself should not be expensive. And they set that up. Banyule, right close, right close to here. There's some crazy people here who, who took over the, some public space to let people who live there use it and allow them to use it. When we're talking about nature, it's inspiring. Nature doesn't make any trash. It doesn't exist. There are no, there's no waste in nature. In our global footprint, as humans, we are capable, physiologically, biologically, genetically, we're designed to not make any waste. Waste is a huge problem now. We're, it's something that it's, we don't need to do. We're the only species on Earth that produces waste. Why? Nature does not make waste. It creates, it creates resources. Better still, this is a tree in a very dry place in the southwest of France, very dry place, the Oriental, the Western uh, Pyrenees, that were just the most uh, hit by climate change. These forests contain very, very old trees, which are now dead. So this dead tree, it's got all these holes in it. So there are insects in it who are nourished by it. And then animals that eat those insects. And so now it's like a sponge. When you go into one of the holes that's been dug by a beetle, you find liquid water. That was the end of August last year. It hadn't rained since April. The region was very dry, and there was liquid water running inside that tree. When you're working with the, the wild, Nature always wins. You've seen Machu Picchu, you can see Ankora, you can see Chernobyl. I've, I've been there to see it with my own eyes. The, the, nature wins, nature always wins. It's just a question of time. Watch nature, watch diversity, there's are questions. But we've got good allies. We can choose good allies from the start. <laughs> So you have to have good practices, take them on board. You have to vehicle these practices. I think this is what needs to be done and show an example, live by example, even if that shakes things up. If it's for the right cause, there's no choice. If you don't do it, the problem is collective. It's not just a little bit tricky now because there'll be less fewer bees, it's just we won't be able to live there anymore. And Means you work in the in the arts. I work in gardens. If there's a world where there's no resources, we can't do anything. We can't work. There's no more meaning. So it's the best is to start simplifying as as uh, much as we can now. Here we are. Just to say, we're really on a little, a tiny, fragile planet in the middle of all of that. I think I've reached the end. Thank you very much.
So we have listened to Eric Lenoir. It's very clear, very strong uh, talks. Eric Lenoir, as you could hear, is a landscape designer. And uh, what he told us was, uh, the less we do, the best it is. And he presented his, himself on the screen like a cow. And he said, this is me, an anarchist landscape designer, like the cow we could see. And we asked him to join us for a few more talks, because I want to know a bit more about Eric Lenoir, who joined us. Eric, uh, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we can stand or we can sit. I prefer to sit, but I don't hear you correctly. <laughs> so I'm getting closer to you. Thanks. Do you hear me? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Ah, you have a way to talk very simple, no? It's like a militantism, it's activism. You're an activist, more than a philosopher of uh, landscape design. The act is something very important. You can talk for hours if you don't act, it's no use. Uh, when did you start to work as a landscape designer in this purpose of sustainability? When did it start for you? I tried to start at first, but I, won't, uh, I, wasn't able, I wasn't able of that because the system wants something else. Uh. So it took me something like 20 years to, to, to do it like I want. Uh, because the system wants a quick result. The system wants more than quick results. It wants an image, um, um, a global image that, that um, that's... Uh, How can I tell that in English? Um, Say it in French, maybe I will be able to translate. Uh, um, yeah. They are the, um, a collective ima image, a collective image of the gardens that needs, that needs to be a certain way. Uh. Uh, if, you, uh, if you watch the movie um, Edward Sider Hands, mm -hmm. you know, the Edouard Tim Burton Madagen, movie, with, said, that's it. Yes. You can see the gardens in it. Yes. That's part of the imagination of people. They want something close to that, like in uh, Desperate Housewives and everything. There's an, image, uh, there's an image of the garden that leads to that. People do the things, but they don't know why. They uh. just want to have a, a, a clean garden, um, a showy garden, but they don't know why. They don't use it. They don't live in it. They don't play in it. You would say that the garden is like a handbag? Like a handbag? Kama ah. sakama? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm trying to understand what you mean with that. Like uh, you show your garden oh, more than you it, live yes. with yeah, your okay. garden. Okay, I didn't have the reference because I don't have any handbag. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what do you have in your bag to make the garden? In my bag? Yeah. At first it's a backpack. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a backpack. And what, what are your tools? Quels sont vos outils? Yeah. What are your tools? A knife. A knife? A knife. I need a knife. I need a bit of a rope. A rope. Yeah, <laughs> you know? God. Yes, a rope. I need a book. I need a... I need a... A cahier. Uh, is it? Comment dit un cahier? Yeah, some paper. Some to, I need some notes. paper and a, and a pen to, 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 to draw on it or to write on it. That's all. What do you look at at first when you arrive in, on the site? On the site? Yes. What do you look at first? You look at the sky, you look at the ground, you look around. There's not any order. Something jump into my eyes at first. It depends on the situation. One of the problems is that uh, people want a, a solution, a, a, the one solution. There is no one solution. There are ways mm. and none solution. Mm. That, the truth is that. So you have to be humble. Uh, with anything you propose, uh, you may have the solution within your purpose, but it's not sure. Mm. And so you have to, uh, to explore all the ways that appears to you. Mm. And the first thing that... Oh. And the first thing, just tell us, the, there will be the artistic talk now, starting now. And I can see that... Maria Baranowska and Lieberman will talk, and Andrea Salustri just will, will take for the first thing Eric Lenoir and will let them talking.
So what is the first thing? What is my, what, sorry? The first thing to do? The first thing to do is to do nothing. <laughs> it's to watch, uh, to watch, to understand what happens there. Thank you very much, Eric. You're we'll really welcome. Continue on the artistic talk.